Well, welcome to Exodus and Leviticus. A um, lot of information covering this class, as you can imagine. There are 67 chapters, uh, 40 chapters in Exodus and 27 chapters in Leviticus. So that's going to be really difficult uh, to cover in 13 weeks, but we're going to do the best we can. And so I'm not going to, you know, we're not going to read verse by verse because we just don't have time to do that. We obviously will have to leave some things out because you just, you cannot cover it all. So we're going to try to hit the main points, the highlights, instead of, you know, going verse by verse and, and dissecting every little point, every verse. We just don't have time to do that. So there may be some things that are left out that you, why didn't he talk about that? It's because you got to cut somewhere. Right, and so that's a, a real problem when you're teaching a, a Bible class with limited time, and you, you struggle with what do I cover, what do I cut. But we're going to do our best so that when you finish this course, you'll have a really good understanding of the main things that God would have us to learn uh, in these two books. So before we get into our study itself, you've got you should have uh, the registration form. Please make sure you leave those with me tonight because I need to take those to Rick so he'll he'll uh, create a role for me. So please don't leave, you know, make sure you leave those with me. You also should have a, uh, a syllabus and then some study questions. Uh, and so if you would, let's look at the syllabus really quickly. Try not to spend a lot of time on this. And if you look over it, you have questions later, uh, please feel free to ask or if you have questions tonight, just let me know. Um, so I have up there at the top is my email at uh, the Etowah congregation where I preach. That is the best way to reach me. Uh, so if at any time during the week, if you have a question about some of the questions I've given you or something we went over in class or something, uh, just email me and that's the best way to get me and I'll respond. At least I should respond. Okay, when you're a preacher, you find out that sometimes emergencies crop up. But if you email me something timely and I don't get back to you timely because somebody got sick or something, I'm not going to hold you accountable for that. That'll be my fault. Okay, So I will try to communicate with you in a timely manner. But if you'll email me, I try to check that every day um, and I will try to get back with you as quickly as possible. Uh, so let's take a look at one of the things you're interested in if you're if you're taking the course for credit, obviously if you're just auditing the class, then you don't have to do any of these things. I encourage you to do it anyway because it's for your benefit, and I'm sure you probably will. But especially if you're taking the class for credit, then under evaluation here, you'll see that's how your grade uh, will be calculated. So you will get 10 points per class just for attending. Okay, So you'll get points for that. Uh, the school policy is that you are not allowed to miss any more than three classes and still get credit. So if you have to miss more than that, you can't get credit. If there's some kind of extenuating circumstances, you can talk to Rick. I'll dump that on him because he's the director of the school. Whatever he wants to do, we'll do it. You know, we want to work with you. And But the general rule is you need to be here. But you will get points for doing that. Uh, you will have some questions with each chapter, so you have the the first ones tonight. Uh, you, see, you see four points of questions, so that's going to add up pretty good. There'll, there'll be a lot of points that you can get uh, for doing those, okay? And we will go through those. Uh, so all those questions come straight out of the lecture notes. We will cover it, and you can try to work on those in class if you want, or certainly you can do them at home and those will be due next week. So each week I'll give you some and, and they'll be due the next class period. Then your class notes. I know a lot of uh, times the instructors will give out the notes and those are really helpful because I go back and refer to them in the classes that I've taken, but I'm not that nice. So I'm meaner to you. I want you to take notes. Okay, so what I have up here is this is an outline that we'll go through and couldn't get the projector to work. We're working on that. So hopefully next week we'll have a PowerPoint because 
that's about as good as my writing gets. And I apologize because it's really bad. But hopefully we'll have a PowerPoint from here on out and you can see that. Uh, but here's why I want you to do that because I, as a lot of y'all know, I was a teacher for 30 years. And so I know a little bit about the research. Uh, if I hand you all this stuff and my students in class, you say, why don't you just give us the notes? Like, well, you want me to do all the work? Which, of course, they did. Uh, but if you give somebody that, the retention rate is not very good. It just isn't. Okay, and my objective for this class is not to be mean. I don't want to be mean to anybody, and I want you all to make an A in here, but I want you to learn the material, right? I want you to learn what God wants you to know. And so if I hand it all out, then it's, it's easier not to really study and, and not to pay attention. So it's better, and all the research indicates this, you're, I don't know the science behind it about the brain, but when you write things down, you remember it better than just reading it or just looking at it, okay? Now, if you want to type and take notes on your laptop or something, I'm okay with that, that's fine. But again, let me share the research with you. The research shows that people who type, as opposed to people who write, they don't retain it as well. For some reason, that's the way the brain works. So if you write, you remember it better than if you type. But I don't care either way, just as long as you take the notes, because as you see, you'll get quite a few points. We'll check at the, at the end of each class. You come up, show me your notes for that day, and I'll mark off that you took your notes. So you get, you get points for it. But my objective there is not to torture you. It's because I think you will remember things better if you write it down. Okay? Uh, so that's the, the logic behind that. And then you see there will be a midterm test, and there's a final test. That's the school policy, so we're expected to do that. And I do want you to know, as I said, there's a lot of stuff in here that we'll have to skip because I just I can't cover it all. I will not ask you anything on the test that I did not cover in class. Okay, I'm not expecting you to, well, when they sacrificed the lamb, what did they do with the kidneys? Because that is in there, but we're not going to cover that, right? So I'm not going to ask you anything because I'm trying to trick you or well, they'll never know this one. That's I don't want to do that. All the test questions will come from everything that we cover in class. And if you'll notice those questions that you have there, somebody, what does it say on the top there? Study guide, right? That's a hint, hint, that probably a whole bunch, maybe all of your test questions will be just like those. That's where they'll come from. Okay, so those are the things that I really want you to know. And as I said, I'm going to give you those answers. We'll go through it and you can try to get it in class or what I would recommend. Again, just take notes. And then when you go home this week, then you can go through and you should be able and the questions are in order. So you should be able just to go through, you know, oh, there's number one. Well, there's number two. It should be pretty simple. But the more you write this stuff down, the better you will remember it. And so that's that's why we're doing it that way. Okay. And then you see the approximate schedule. We'll probably have to make adjustments and because this is, uh, you don't know how quickly or how slowly you got to go through something. It depends on every, when I taught school, every class was different. So sometimes the students would really get it and I could move on quickly. Other times, maybe people are confused and I got to go back over it. And so I don't really know, right? So this is a, an approximate guess of about what will be trying to cover each week, but we may have to adjust that a little bit. As you can see, we're going to spend a whole lot more time on Exodus than we are in Leviticus, because honestly, there's a lot of stuff in Leviticus that's repeated from Exodus. It's like God is reiterating to Moses, hey, remember all this stuff I told you to do? Well, let's go over it again. I want you to do this, and I want you to do... So a lot of it we will have covered in Exodus, so when we get to those parts of Leviticus, we can just kind of summarize through it pretty quickly. Okay, so that's why you kind of have the disparity. And again, Leviticus is a little bit shorter uh, than Exodus. So you see there at the bottom, chapter questions assigned each week. They're due the next class period. You can turn them in late, but I will deduct some points from that if they're late. Again, the end of each class, we'll check the notes. Uh, the midterm is take home. That'll be due the next week. So you'll have a week to do that, and then you'll turn that in the next week, you can turn it in a week late, but that'd only be half credit. So we need to, you know, and again, if some kind of extending wedding circumstance comes up, 
just talk to me, we'll work it out. But generally, that's what we want to do. And then the final again is take home, and so I'll give you two weeks to do that one. And so up at the top again, you'll see I've got the address of the Etowah congregation. That's where I want you to send it. And you just put my name on the envelope like at the bottom. Put attention, Mark Stevenson. I get all the mail anyway, but uh, we will provide you with an envelope with a stamp on it. Rick's going to do that, so you won't have to fool with that. But you can just mail it to me. And as long as it's postmarked within two weeks of the last class, then it's not late. And so that should give you plenty of time to do it, hopefully. All right, anybody have any questions about anything on the syllabus? Okay, if you think of something later, uh, just feel free to let me know. So we are going to obviously have to kind of fly through this, but I want you to feel free to ask questions. You have a question. If you need me to repeat something, throw your hand up. Hey, I didn't get, could you go over that one more time? I'll be glad to do it. If we have to cut something off at the end, so be it. I would rather do that than you don't understand half of what I said for 13 weeks because we were going so fast, right? So don't feel like, oh, I need to ask a question, but I can't because I know he's in a hurry. We're in a hurry, but at the same time, I really want you to understand it. So if you didn't get something, please feel free to ask and, and I will slow down or I'll repeat it, whatever we need to do. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's kind of get started with the course introduction. So again, these are some things that you just need to kind of take some notes on, hit the highlights, and as I said, you'll get points for doing this, but all your test questions will come out of the things that I'm going to tell you. All right, so just some very general information. This very first part, I wouldn't ask you this on the test, but just so you can kind of get this in your mind. Um, when we look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament can be divided into five basic sections. Okay? And so the first section is are known as the books of the law. Okay? And there are five of those. We'll, we'll talk more about them in a minute. The books of the law, and there are five of those. Okay, that's the first set. That starts with Genesis, first section. Then the second section is known as the books of history. The books of history. There are 12 of those. And again, I'm not going to ask you all this on the test, but just, just so you kind of are familiar with it. So you got five books of law, then you got 12 books of history. After that, you have five books of poetry. Okay, five books of poetry. Then following that, you have five what we call the major prophets. And then the Old Testament closes out, you have 12 of what we call the minor prophets. Okay, so you have five and then 12 and then five and then five and then 12 again. Okay, and I do want to make the distinction, and y'all probably know this, what, what's the difference between a major prophet and a minor prophet? Does that mean one's more important than the other? Yeah, it's, it's just the length of the book, right? Jeremiah is longer. Uh, than Obadiah or whatever. So it's just, minor prophets doesn't mean, well, they're not important, but those books are shorter. Okay, so that's what the different major and minor, that, that's really all it is. Everything's God's Word, so it's all important. Right? But that's just a kind of a convenient way to divide the Old Testament, so that should be a total of 39 books. So the focus of our study, of course, is going to be on that first section the five books of the law. And we're going to further break that. We're not going through all five of them. We're looking at two. Okay, And so this section, the books of the law, is known as the Pentateuch. Okay, So that's definitely something you'll want to know. The Pentateuch. Okay, That's the name given to these five books of the law that the Bible starts out with. And what does that word mean? Well, it simply means five volumes. So that's descriptive, simple and descriptive. These are five volumes, right? So the Pentateuch, books of the law. Okay? And so the five books in this section, in order, would be Genesis. Then you have Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the five books of the law. Okay, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. 
So the way the preaching school breaks it down, there is a class called Pentateuch 1, and that goes over the book of Genesis. Then you have Pentateuch 3, which that goes over Numbers and Deuteronomy. So we are in Pentateuch 2. We're doing Exodus and Leviticus. So that gives you kind of an overall perspective of, of what we're looking for. Okay. Now, some people may ask, I think you all know, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. Some people may ask, say, well, why in, in any school like this, why are we wasting time studying the Old Testament? I mean, why do we need to do that? Because after all, it's my understanding, I mean, we're not really under the old law anymore. Is that correct? Yeah, we're not under the old law anymore. Uh, didn't we, don't, aren't we under the New Testament? Isn't there a new covenant today? Yes, absolutely. Right? So some people say, well, I, I don't understand. Well, we want to know that for sure, that yes, we're not under the old law anymore because there are obviously still Jewish people today who still try to at least follow some parts of this and they say that it's still in effect. But what does the Bible say? So the first verse we're going to look at is Colossians 2 and verse 14. And as we go through the whole class, I will give you Bible references. Some of them we will read. Some of them we won't. I'll just mention to you because we just don't have time to read everything, right? So some of them I'll just mention, hey, here's your reference for what I'm telling you right now. But let's look at this one, uh, Colossians 2 and verse 14. Because we see here that yes, Christ in fact nailed the old law to the cross when He was crucified. Colossians 2 and 14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross. Okay, so it is a fact, a biblical fact, that you and I are not under the old law anymore, what some people call the law of Moses. We're not under that anymore. That died on the cross with Jesus. Okay, so yes, that's a fact. So what are we to make of the old law then? Well, it was always intended by God to be temporary. It wasn't a permanent system. And that wasn't by mistake. That wasn't, well, God thought this would work and it didn't work, so He had to go to plan B. No, God intended that from the beginning, that this system was going to be in place for a certain period of time. And it was there to prepare mankind for the coming of Christ, the coming of the Messiah. Okay, So it was to set up those events. And so for a, it was only designed for a certain period of time, and you and I do not live in that period of time. Okay, What we see in the old law is they, of course, had to make animal sacrifices. Now, does anybody know, how often do they have to do that? The, yeah, and at the very minimum, every year, right? They had to have a Day of Atonement every year. That was the system that they were under. So what we see is that the blood of animals is not sufficient to wash away our sins. Whereas when Christ died on the cross and we are baptized into Him, we don't have to make these animal sacrifices, right? Because the blood of Jesus has a more permanent effect on our sins, which the blood of animals did not. So this was a it was a temporary system. So in the we're not going to read this, but Hebrews 8, verses 6 through 10, that's where you see that Christ brought a new covenant, a better covenant. Okay, that his blood is going to cleanse our sins far better than the blood of bulls and goats. Okay, so again, we're not going to read that passage, but that's one of the passages that where you would find that. Okay. Now, when we look at Matthew 5 and 17, we do want to look at this one. Because what did Jesus have to do with the law? Because some people, the Pharisees, all these people that were against Jesus, do you guys know, what were they accusing Him of doing regarding the law? Replacing God. Yeah, and what, was He respecting the law or according to them? 
Now, they, they said, you came to destroy the law, right? Well, look at Matthew 5 and 17. Jesus did not come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it, to bring an end to it because it had served its purpose. Okay? But that's not the same thing as destroying the law. Right? Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He came to fulfill it because that was God's plan all along. That This was a temporary system, and when the Christ came, that would all be replaced with a better covenant. And so that's what Jesus came to do. Okay? Now, so people still may say, well, okay, fine, we're not under the old law, and they were for a while, but we're not. So again, we come back to that question, well then, why should we waste any time studying it? Well, it's not a waste of time because it's what God wants us to do. So look at Romans 15 and verse 4. And that's why we're in this class, is because of Romans 15 verse 4, among other things. But why study the Old Testament? Romans 15 and 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Okay, so we see here, first of all, that God commands us, He's expecting us to study the old law, even though we're not under it anymore, for what purpose? Yeah, for our learning, right? For, he wants us to understand this. And you go, well, again, why would we have to understand something that doesn't apply to us? J.W. said it right. Because it sets the stage for the New Testament, the New Covenant. That's exactly why God wants us to do it. There are lessons for us to learn, as hopefully we're going to see in Exodus and Leviticus. There's a lot of valuable things in there. Yeah, I don't have to you know, sacrifice a lamb anymore or a bull or whatever, but that's not everything that's in here. So there are a lot of lessons for us to learn and there are plenty of things, certain aspects of the old law that Christ reiterated, right? So some of the things, quite a few things in the old law carried forward into the new law and we need to understand those things, right? And why are we doing those things? Well, that's what we're going to look at. So we learn, uh, among other things, about the, the promises and the prophecies about Christ and how Christ is going to fulfill those things in the New Testament. This is more evidence that Jesus is who He says He is. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. And so you, if you understand the Old Testament Scriptures, that's better evidence for that. And if you look at the book of Matthew, who's Matthew writing to? He's writing to the Jews, right? What's he trying to convince them of? <laughs> yeah, this guy right here, Jesus, he is the Messiah that you've been waiting for. Well, don't see him conquering the Romans. That's not his job. You misunderstand the whole thing, right? But the whole book of Matthew, Matthew is writing to the Jews to try to make them understand. And so he frequently goes to the Old Testament. Here's another prophecy that this man right here fulfilled. Hey, here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. All with the same guy. What do you think? Maybe it's him? Right? So there's plenty of things that we need to know and understand about the Old Testament. And so this study, I think, is very valuable. for. I know it's been valuable for me just preparing uh, to share things with you all. So I, I hope and pray that when you get through this class, you're going to say, yeah, that was, that was interesting and I learned some things I didn't know and some things that God wants us to know. All right, so let's dig in a little bit to the book of Exodus. So we're over here at this point. So let me give you a few introductory remarks about before we get into, we're hoping to cover chapter 1 and chapter 2 tonight. Uh, that's pretty ambitious. I don't know if we'll be able to do it, but so be it. Like I said, we can adjust if we need to, but that's the goal. Uh, so first of all, let's talk about the name of the book of Exodus. Now this book, you know, what I'm looking at it in my Bible. Now these are the names of the children of Israel. And how can I read this? How come I can read it? Yeah, so it's in English. Was it originally written in English? What was it written in? Hebrew, right. Okay, so it's originally written in Hebrew. The Jews at the time, they referred to the book of Exodus as Shemoth. And I don't know, I probably butchered that name. Uh, that's what they called it. 
Book of Shemoth. They, did, they didn't call it the Exodus. Okay? So either one would be appropriate. There's nothing wrong with calling it Exodus, but I'm just saying originally that was the name that they gave to it in the earliest days. So apparently, from what I could trace, apparently uh, the name Exodus was applied during the 3rd century B.C. So quite a few years, centuries after it was originally written. But this was applied by Greek-speaking Jews uh, when they translated this book from Hebrew to Greek. And so they called it the Exodus. Now, it is appropriate. It's fine to call it the Exodus. Uh, does anybody know what the word Exodus means? Going out. Yeah, going out. Okay, And so obviously what the book of Exodus focuses on primarily, who's going out from where? Yeah, the children of Israel who have been in bondage in Egypt and God through Moses is going to lead them out. So the, the going out, that's the book of Exodus. And so it is appropriate that you can call it that, but I did want you to know the original uh, name that the, the Jews called it. So let's talk a little bit about the content of this book. Uh, so first of all, let's go back just for a minute to the book of Genesis. As we, again, we put this in the Bible, it's important you, you understand things in context. Okay? And so if we look at the book of Genesis, obviously it talks about the beginning of God's creation. We, we see all that. And it also talks about the beginning of this nation of people, the Israelites, the Hebrews, the Jews, this the beginning of this these chosen people of God. And so we first see that in the book of Genesis. And so really what Exodus does is it continues this story that was begun in the book of Genesis. It's a continuation of that. And it, it continues this story of the history of these chosen people. Okay, so that's what that's what we're going to be uh, looking at. And so Genesis, and I'm sure you guys have read it probably multiple times, and I'd say there's a whole lot of people reading Genesis right now. Why? New Year's resolution, right? You start on January, I'm, I'm going to read the Bible, I'm going to read every book of the Bible, and so I'm going to start with Genesis, so that's a good place to start, you know, might as well. And uh, then maybe by February, that kind of fizzles out, maybe sooner than that, Right? But this first week of the year, there are probably a whole bunch of people reading Genesis right now, and that's a good thing. Hopefully they'll stick with it. So Genesis, the end of that book, it ends with the, the Israelites. They have come to Egypt. Okay. Now, does anybody remember why they came to Egypt? What? Yeah, yeah there was a famine, right? A tremendous famine. And somebody had known that was coming because of God, and somebody had stored up food. Who was that somebody? Joseph, right. Very good, thank you. That's right, Joseph. And so Joseph, who was a Hebrew, right, he had saved all these people because he had prepared, because this, was, this famine lasted how many years? Seven years, right? So he had, But they'd had seven years of plenty before. So he had done it. So he had risen all the way up to only Pharaoh was above Joseph. And Joseph wasn't even an Egyptian. But Pharaoh, he loved Joseph so much because Joseph had saved all these people, made Pharaoh look good in the process, right? So Joseph had risen to this great position. And so his family, and they, they had come into Egypt because the word got around that, hey, that's where the food is. Nobody else has any food, but if we're going to survive, uh, that's where we need to go. So again, Exodus kind of picks up the story Genesis ends with the death of Joseph. Okay, but those people, that's where they are. They are in Egypt, and that's where Exodus is going to pick it up. Now, the book of Exodus covers a time period uh, that's roughly about 360 years, okay, give or take a weekend. About 360 years covered in uh, the book of Exodus. So it picks up from the death of Joseph. That's where it begins, and then it ends with the building of the tabernacle. So that whole, because the, the Israelites are going to be enslaved for a couple of centuries, right? So this takes some time. 
Now, Exodus is going to cut a lot of that down, but basically that's the time period that we're talking about. So it's from the death of Joseph up until the building of the tabernacle, what we're going to see. And then Leviticus will continue on uh, things about the tabernacle and the sacrifices and, the, of course, the Levite priesthood, those sort of things. Okay? Um, now, this book can be roughly divided into three sections. Now, we're basically just going to go chapter by chapter, but again, to give your brain kind of an overview, like if you were flying over it, and this is kind of an easy way to remember kind of what part of the book is talking about what, okay? So the first section, which is almost half the book, chapters 1 through 18, this is talking about the bondage of the Israelites and then their deliverance from Egypt by God, but using Moses and Aaron as his instruments. Okay, but you see that in chapters 1 through 18, so it's almost half the book. Okay, then you have the next section, chapters 19 through 24. This is when God gives the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. So the Ten Commandments and, and everything else that it wasn't just the Ten Commandments, everything else that went with it. Okay, so that's the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, chapters 19 through 24. And then the last section, chapters 25 through 40, deals primarily with the building of the tabernacle. Okay, the building of the tabernacle, the, the place of worship. Okay, so their bondage and their deliverance, the first section, the law at Mount Sinai, the second section, and then the building of the tabernacle in the third section. As I said, we're basically going to go through chapter by chapter and just kind of hit the highlights in each chapter. Now, let's talk about the author. Who wrote the book of Exodus? Okay. Now, who really wrote it? God did, right? But Moses put pen to paper. You're right, okay? So, but God told Moses what to write. But Moses was the human being that actually wrote it down. Okay, but don't want we don't want to think, well, Moses made all this stuff up. I mean, he got it from God, but but he's the one that, that wrote it down. Okay, now Moses is the author of the entire Pentateuch, these five books. So Exodus and Leviticus, of course, will be a part of that. Now, some people, there are some religious people who I'm sure are sincere and well meaning and you know, so I'm not mocking them or anything like that. But there are some people out there that are trying to say, no, 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 I don't think Moses wrote this. Okay. Now, before we look at how we know he did, one thing I want to point out about those people, which again, we, we try to do with kindness and just say, well, this is why this doesn't make sense. But for one thing, they don't have an alternative. Well, well okay, if Moses didn't write it, who did? Well, I don't know, but it wasn't Moses. Well, if you don't know, well, how do you know it wasn't Moses? Right? So they don't have an alternative. And the other thing is they don't have any evidence. Well, okay, if you think it wasn't Moses, show me your evidence for why it wasn't him. Well, I don't have any evidence. I just think it wasn't. Well, that's, you know, you, give me some evidence. Right? So what I'm going to give y'all is evidence that this is how we know it was Moses who wrote this. So they don't have the evidence that it wasn't him, but we do. Where do we get the evidence from? From the Bible, not from me. From the Bible, okay. So we we're going to see three different pieces of evidence here. That's what that's what one two three is. Three different pieces of evidence, and I'll give you these scriptural references. So how do we know that Moses is the author? Well, for number one, the book of Exodus itself tells us that Moses was the author. Okay, so if you look at the EX, that means Exodus. If you look at Exodus 17 and verse 14, you will see, and the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book. That's pretty plain. God said to Moses, aren't you? Write this down. Okay, so that tells us that. Exodus 24 and 4, same thing. Just another verse. It says, Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. Moses wrote it down. Okay? So that's the first piece of evidence we have. And there are a couple other places, we, but you get the point, right? So 
Number one, the book of Exodus itself identifies Moses as the author. Point number two, Jesus identifies Moses as the author. So unless we want to call Jesus a liar, then I'm pretty sure Moses wrote it. Okay, so Mark 1 and verse 44. And saith unto him, Jesus talking here, Say thou nothing uh, to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded. For a testimony unto them. He'd cleanse this guy. You've you got to do, again, you've got to follow the old law. Where did the old law come from? He said, Moses commanded. Now, we understand what Jesus meant by that. Did this law come from Moses? It came from God, right? So what's Jesus saying there? Is He wrong? He's saying Moses wrote it down. Right? So the law was written, it was given by God, but it was written down by Moses. And as we'll see as we go through this book, it was given to the people by Moses. Why do you think that is? Why would, why would Moses do it? God, God yeah, real simple answer, right? Because God said so. Right? God said, I'm going to give you the law of Moses and I want you to go down and tell the people what I said. Okay? And so Jesus here is acknowledging that. That's what He means by do as Moses commanded. He's saying, Moses gave you the law that came from God. You need to obey it. Okay? So where is the law of Moses? In the Pentateuch, these first five books. Now John 7, 19 basically says the same thing. Did not Moses give you the law? Jesus talking. Did, didn't Moses give you the law? Where's the law? Well, it's in Exodus and Leviticus. <laughs> That's where it is. Right? So Jesus identifies Moses as the author. So number one, the book tells us that he is. Number two, Jesus tells us that he is. And number three, just a little icing on the cake, the Apostle Paul tells us that Moses was the author. So if you look at Acts 3, 22 and 23, again, we're not going to go read all that, but here Paul says, And Moses truly said unto the fathers. So Paul is acknowledging this came from Moses, which really came from God, but Moses is the one that wrote it down. Moses is the one that told everybody because that's the way God wanted it done. Okay, So that's why often we call the old law the law of Moses. Is it, do you think, is it sinful to call it the law of Moses? No, it's fine, right? What we want to make sure that we understand, and when, if we're trying to teach others, we don't want to confuse anybody that they think, again, that Moses came up with the Ten Commandments or these were all laws. That Mo so just make that distinction that it's, it's law of Moses, meaning that Moses was God's instrument. It's God's law, but Moses wrote it and He gave it out. Okay, now that, that may seem like a nitpicky detail, but there's so much religious confusion in the world today. We, just, we know what that means, but we want to make sure if we're telling others, just so, oh, so Moses is like God? Well, no, no, no. You know, so make sure we understand that. But it's still, it's okay to call it the law of Moses because he was kind of the law giver through, through God. Okay. Uh, all right. What about the, the date? When was this book written? And, it's hard to come up with an exact date, but I think we have a pretty good idea. And it's, it's not absolutely necessary that we know the exact date. Um, how do we know that it's not absolutely necessary? Do what? Yeah, because if we really needed to know that, would God have told us? Yeah, He told us, right? So, but it's still, it's kind of interesting to figure out a, a general timeline, like when, about when did this happen? So let's, let's kind of go through this. But, you know, we may be off by a few years, but I think we can get it pretty close. And again, we want to use biblical evidence. So I want you to look at 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 1. So we're going to do some math. And yeah, it made my head hurt too, but, that's, but the calculator did most of the work. But I just want you to see where I'm getting this number from. That I, I want you to know I'm not just pulling this out of a hat somewhere. And so we can come up with a pretty good approximate date for the exodus from Egypt. And then from there, we can kind of figure out, okay, well, when did Moses write the book? 
but we first need to figure out when did the Israelites actually leave Egypt. Okay, The Bible does give us clues about this where we can come up with a, a, a pretty good number. So we base our calculations on this passage in 1 Kings and, and another one we're going to look at. 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 1. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziph, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. Okay, so we've, we've got some numbers that we can work with here. Now, if we were to go to 1 Kings 11 and verse 42, we would see that Solomon was king for how long? Y'all probably know this. 40 years. We're going to see that number 40 a lot. It happens a lot in the Bible. Significant number. So 40 years. Okay. Well, we think, and these were the numbers a little hazy, but basically about 974 to 934 B.C. would have been approximately when Solomon was the king. Okay. Thus, that would, using the math here, that means he began to build the temple about 970 B.C. Okay. Because it says, tells us when it was in his reign. Right, so it's about 970 BC because he started reigning 974 and it's the fourth year. So remember in BC, how do the numbers work? Go backwards, right? So if we were in BC right now and we just left 2023, this would be 2022 because the numbers get smaller until they get to AD and then they expand. So he becomes king in 474, says in the fourth year, that would be, I'm, I'm sorry, 974. Fourth year would be 970. So about 970, he starts building the temple, which we're told that was 480 years after the Exodus. Okay, So if I did the math correctly, that would place the Exodus right around the year 1450 B.C. That should be right within a year or two anyway. It should be in the ballpark. So about 1450 B.C., that is when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. That's when they crossed the Red Sea. Okay. But as we said, it, it doesn't really matter that we have an exact date, but it would have been somewhere around there. And so that means they would have wandered in the wilderness from about 450 B.C. down to about 410 B.C. Because again, they were there for 40 years. So 450 to 410, that's also, of course, going to be when Moses dies, around 410. So, you know, we can go by that. So when did Moses write the book of Exodus? Well... Again, we don't know for sure, but you would imagine it was it must have been sometime during that 40 years between 450 and 410 while they were in the wilderness. I'd say it's likely that Moses wrote it toward the end of that period, closer to the end of his life probably, but we don't know for sure, but most likely sometime during that 40 years. So we've got a pretty good idea when the Exodus was and therefore we've got a pretty good idea when the book was written. Okay, so any uh, questions about that? All right, well, let's take a look then at chapter one. Yes? Sorry. It's okay. Question. You said about the year Moses died. Said 410. About 410 BC. BC. Yeah, it's all BC. Yes. Um, 1450 BC? <laughs> yes. I hope so, yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm... <laughs> no, 14, 1450. Right, because remember, jo jo uh, Joseph. Um, who am I thinking of? Who was the king? Oh. Yeah, 974, right? And so it said the, the uh, Exodus, he started building it in 970. And it was 480 years before that. So if we're going back in history, the numbers would be going higher. Yeah, so it should be around 450. Unless my math is wrong, and it could be. Question? Did I? Well, maybe I did say 450. I may have said that. Okay, I probably did. So y'all yeah, need to create. Sometimes I get in such a hurry, I just, yeah, 1450. Okay, 1450. Died about 14, 1410. Okay, because you said 410. Did I? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to say, that would make Can we start this tape over? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was making sure that was 
I'm sure about math. Yeah, yeah. That guys, there's a reason I didn't teach math when I taught yeah. school. Okay, so yeah, fourteen fifty would have been about the time of the Exodus. They're in the wilderness for forty years. So that would be fourteen ten, and that's when Moses died because remember he was not allowed to cross the Jordan into Canaan. Okay, so I think we we finally got it right. So, but yeah, y'all please point out if I miss say something. I get on a roll and, and I don't even realize I did it, so please correct me because we, we want to get this right. All right, so chapter one. So the first, again, I've kind of divided it into sections and we're going to try to hit the highlights. So verses one through six, like I said, we, we just don't have time to, to read this and then go through it. So I do encourage you every week, obviously you, you didn't know this week how much we were going to do, but uh, try to, looking on your syllabus, try to read ahead for next week. Look at uh, those other chapters, and that way if you've got questions or at least you'll have it somewhat in your head, this is this is what we're talking about. I wish we had the time to read the chapter and then go back through, but we'd, we'd never get through if we did that. So verses 1 through 6, uh, what we see here, Moses begins by listing the descendants of, of Jacob, or, or talks about Jacob and his descendants who came to Egypt to escape the famine. So that, that's how Moses starts the book of Exodus. And so what he's doing is he's building a bridge between the end of Genesis and the beginning of the Exodus account. That, that's really all he's doing with this. Okay, So he's just talking about them coming in. So no, I'm not going to ask you how you need to spell all those names and tell me all those people. That's not the important thing. Okay, But what's important, a uh, couple of things. One is that it's clear from this that the Pentateuch, as you go through it, these five books, it is a continuous story. And it, it's really clear too by the style that it's written by the same author. It's yet more evidence that, yeah, Moses wrote all five of these. Okay? And in my Bible, which doesn't mean anything because somebody added it, but mine says the second book of Moses called Exodus. right? But it is clear as you read through, you go, it looks like the same person is, is writing all this. But... So it, it's a story that's being told uh, by Moses, by divine inspiration. But the important thing, more than just knowing those names in these first six verses, the important thing is what we're seeing is that the nation of Israel started out rather small. There weren't a lot of them when they went to Egypt. But that's going to change. And Pharaoh ain't going to like it. Okay, but to see what they become from such a small beginning. And that may have been why God told Moses to, to put this down, because God has a purpose for everything that He does. You go, why would He give us those names? Well, it's just the idea that it didn't start out really large. Okay, but that's going to change. All right, so let's look at verses uh, 7 through 14. So here we see the account of the population of the Hebrews really starts to grow and expand. They start out with this small number, but they're not going to stay there. And so what we want to do real quick is let's look at Exodus, skip ahead a little bit. Let's go to chapter 12 and verse 37. Notice the number. When the Jews finally leave Egypt, how many were there? Let's, let's look at the number that were given. So in Exodus 12, 37, and the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. So about 600,000 men. That's not counting the women and children. 600,000 men. When they leave Egypt, that's how many there were. So starting out with a really small number, maybe just a few hundred or a couple of thousand. We, we don't know the exact number. Now, 600,000 men. Okay. So, if we project, let's be really conservative with our estimate. Let's say that each man had one wife, because hopefully that's what he's supposed to have, and one child. Now, is that really realistic? Most of the families back then were a lot bigger than that, right? But let, let's just be really conservative. Let's say, what, what if one man, one woman, one child? If that were the case, that would be 1.8 million people. Close to 2 million people. But we're sure that's not the case. 
Right? Some of these people, I mean, they had 10, 12 kids, you know. And so you're probably looking at a minimum of three or four million people, something like that. There's no way to know for sure, but it would be a big number. Okay, so starting out really small, and then a couple hundred years later, by the time they leave, they have prospered greatly, even though they're enslaved. But they have still prospered in a sense. Okay, now, what this shows is that when we look at Genesis 46 and 3, you know, we're not going to go back and read that, but God had made a promise to Jacob about this. And he told him, he said, fear not, don't worry about going to Egypt. I'm going to make of you a great nation. Okay, So he promised Jacob that. Then you go to Genesis 12. And that's where he promised Abraham the same thing. I'm going to make a great nation of you. And so that's coming true by the time they're leaving Egypt. They have become a great nation. So much so that they have become a major concern to the new Pharaoh. Okay? So that begins to lead our story, our narrative, these events. So we're told in these verses 7 through 14 that a new Pharaoh comes to the throne, not identified. We can kind of guess, but not exactly sure. But a new Pharaoh comes in, and we're told about this new Pharaoh in verse 8, which knew not Joseph. Now, does that mean that this is a Pharaoh who had never heard of Joseph and knew nothing about him? Probably not, because Joseph had done such tremendous things. I think Pharaoh had heard of him, but I think what this means is he doesn't care anything about him. He doesn't appreciate him, right? Because Pharaohs, as you can imagine, just like a lot of the absolute kings of Europe and whatever, they're a pretty self-centered lot, right? When you got everybody doing everything for you and you're the center of the universe, at least you think you are. Well, pharaohs were like that too. So pharaohs were notorious for when a new pharaoh would come in, they would start destroying the monuments of the previous pharaohs. Well, don't worry about what that guy did. Look at me. I'm the pharaoh now. I don't care what Bozo did back here. So they would erase monuments and tear them down. And they didn't want anybody focused on anything but themselves. Right? And so he's probably, he probably knows something about what Joseph did, but his attitude is who cares, right? This guy, Joseph, is dead. The Pharaoh that he helped is dead. Joseph can't do anything for me, so why should I care about anything that Joseph did? If he could help me, that might be different, but he can't. So this means that the new Pharaoh has no... The old one had respect unto the Israelites because of what Joseph had done. The new one does not. What do I care about the people of Joseph? Who cares? I don't owe them anything. Right, So that, I think that's the meaning here. Uh, so he doesn't care that Joseph had faithfully served another pharaoh. That's, that's not his concern. Well, which pharaoh is this? Well, we, we don't really know exactly. Uh, again, if we know that Moses lived to be how old? Does anybody know? 120. 120 years, right? So approximately, and we know if he died about 1410, that means he was born around 1530. So it's in that lifespan somewhere. So that would put these events during the 18th dynasty of the pharaohs. Pharaohs had dynasties, like families, and a certain family would rule for a while, then they'd die out, and then you start another dynasty. So the 18th dynasty. So the pharaoh might have been Amenhotep. It could have been Tutmos. We're not really sure. And again, it's not that important. If God had wanted us to know which one it was, He would have told us. But Maybe one of those or one of them right around there it would have been. But a lot of the Egyptian dates are really murky. So their accounting of when this pharaoh ruled were, if you look in different history books, you'll get different dates. Okay, so I don't, I don't think I can tell you for sure well, which pharaoh was it. I don't know for sure. But it was a new pharaoh that didn't care anything about Joseph. That's the important thing that God wants us to know there. So this new pharaoh is very concerned about the Israelites because 
he feels like maybe they actually outnumber the Egyptians. They have prospered so much that they are just really overtaking the place. He, he's really concerned about that, and he's afraid of them. Because it mentions in these verses, he says, you know, what if they, what if they join together with our enemies? Man, they, they might run us over. They, they might take over the country. So Pharaoh, again, being only concerned about himself, that's a real problem. Right? I don't want them overthrowing me. I'm the boss. I want to be in charge here. So he's very concerned about their large numbers, as we said, probably getting into the millions uh, at this point. And so, for one thing, he's going to decide to enslave them. And this might have been just out of pettiness, but I think there might have been, and again, we're, we're kind of guessing here, but he might have had another purpose because it says he's really going to burden them. He's going to He's going to make their lives miserable. They are going to be given very hard physical work to do. And remember in Egypt, you know, a lot of the year it's scalding hot and they're out there doing this hard physical labor. So it may have been that Pharaoh's thinking, you know what, I can work some of them to death. Maybe if I make their lives hard enough, some of them will have a heat stroke or whatever. That may have been, I don't know. But he's determined I'm going to make their life miserable. Because it, and on the one hand, it doesn't make sense. Like, well, if you're afraid they're going to go against you, why would you, wouldn't you be nice to them? But that's why I'm saying maybe he's thinking, well, if I bully them enough, I can wipe some of them out or, or at least I can cow them down in fear. So he decides he's going to, he's going to do that. So he's going to put them in bondage. Uh, so they have to do all this hard physical labor. But even in spite of that, God makes sure that they're thriving, at least in numbers. That, so we see that what Pharaoh, when he does that, it doesn't diminish their numbers like he was hoping maybe that it would. So Pharaoh decides to take drastic action. Okay? And so that brings us to verses 15 through 22. So we'll close out with this because it's, it's really time for us to stop. I was hoping we could get chapter 2. That's okay. We'll try to fix that in next week. So verses 15 through 22. And let me address real quick, because your questions, you're going, wait a minute, but there's chapter 2 questions. Again, I had to kind of guess. So that will not be due next week. It'll, once we finish them, then that's when they're due. So next week, I'll give you another week to do. You'll be able to do all those, and then you'll turn it in after that. Is that does that make sense? So I'm not going to make you try to do the questions before I go over it. So we'll do what we got to do. All right, so verses 15 through 22. So Pharaoh decides to take drastic action. Well, okay, I've, been, I've put them down into bondage, and, but they're still thriving and this doesn't seem to be working too well. So he orders the Hebrew midwives to kill the male babies when they're born. As soon as they're born, strangle the kid, whatever you got to do, kill the kid. And you can tell the mother, oh, the baby died in childbirth because that did happen, obviously. So he says, I want you midwives, kill all the male. You can let the females live but kill all the male Hebrew children. And that way we can cut seriously cut down the population. Okay, So that's what he wanted to do. Well, in these verses we see there are two women mentioned by name. I'm not going to ask you their names. You don't need to know them. Uh, surely those weren't the only two midwives to the Hebrews in Egypt, but maybe they were in charge of the other ones. I don't know why God mentioned those two, but they must have been a position of prominence or something. But I'm sure there was more than two for several million people. But So they're probably in charge. Well, they're told to do this. Well, we see in verse 17 that they refuse to do it. Okay, So who can tell me, if you look at verse 17, why were they afraid to do this? Why did they refuse to kill the children? Yeah, they feared God. Okay, good for them. So they were afraid of they did. Oh, God's gonna you know reap judgment on us if we do this. So we're not gonna do it. Well, they're gonna save the boys. So what do you think is gonna happen? Eventually, <laughs> is somebody gonna be upset? Pharaoh's like, hey, why are all these Hebrew boys running around here? What? Didn't I tell you to kill all them? 
So they're going to get called in on the carpet, which I'm sure they probably expected. Right? Well, you know we're going to get in so much trouble for this. Yeah, yeah. So Pharaoh calls them in. What part of kill all the boys did you not understand? I thought I was pretty clear about that. And yet there's all these little boys running around here. So he, as you can imagine, he's not a happy camper. For two reasons. Number one, his command wasn't followed, which pharaohs weren't used to that either. They consider themselves gods, and so if I say something, you do it. And number two, they're, they're still multiplying. So these two women, they come up with a really good excuse. Because probably they'd given it some thought. Because they knew they were going to get in trouble. We're probably going to get killed for this, you know. So what are we going to tell him when he comes in and we're called in and he starts yelling at us, right? So they've probably given this some thought. And so they tell Pharaoh, why, why didn't you kill him? Well, you know, Your Majesty, you're not going to believe this, but every time we, you know, somebody would come get, hey, she's, you know, Sarah's about to have a baby, you got to come. And so by the time we'd get there, she'd already had the baby. What well, we couldn't kill him then, we're supposed to make it, oh, he died in childbirth, right? Well, he's... So every time we got there, it was too late. The child was already born. And said, you know, because these Hebrew women, they're tough. They're not like the Egyptian women. It is, yeah, that's what I'm getting at, right? So, yeah, so because the question is, because God, we're going to see, God's going to bless these women. God's going to bless these women. So, did they lie? Would God bless liars? That's an easy one, guys. Would God bless liars? No. They didn't have to lie. Okay, so probably what happened was they get called. Hey, Sarah's going to have a baby. Okay, well, I'll be right over. Let's see, what did I do with my shoes? Let's see, I can't. Oh, yeah, I got to bake some beans. I got to. They took their time. Knowing that the baby will be born in the meantime, and we can honestly say, hey, when I got there, the kid was already born. Hopefully, Pharaoh didn't ask him, did you go immediately? Right? So that's probably what they did. They stalled, they delayed, knowing that, hey, these women, they'll go ahead and have the baby. And then we'll have an excuse for not killing the baby. Because the interesting thing about this, when they tell Pharaoh, well, they're, you know, they're tougher than the Egyptian women, Pharaoh would believe that. Because apparently it was true. So you, if you go back and you look at a lot of the drawings that the Egyptians did, you look at the drawings of Egyptian women, you can you can look some of these up and see them. The Egyptian women, they are portrayed, they are drawn as being very small and delicate. But there are some drawings in Egypt of Hebrew women, and they're, let's see, how can I say this? They're big boned. Yeah, they're sturdy. They look like, you know, they're tough women where the Egyptian girls are dainty and, you're right? So apparently, that was true. And when you think about it, again, if the Hebrew women are slaves and they're doing all this hard physical labor and the Egyptian women are somebody's feeding them grapes, it would make sense that... So Pharaoh probably bought that. He's like, oh, oh yeah, well, that could be true, you know, because they are tougher than our women. So this thing, and God blessed them for that. So I don't think they were lying about it, but it was a nice excuse to get them out of you know, not killing these boys. So Pharaoh's not going to give up, though. Like, okay, well, I've I got to do something else. So he's trying to make it look like, well, maybe they just died in childbirth. Well, now he's going to issue a new decree, not going to take any chances. And he tells not just the midwives, but everybody, said, whenever a Hebrew boy is born, I want them thrown into the river. No mistaking that's murder. I mean, but we're just going to do it. I want you to take them and drown them in the river. Just throw them in and they'll drown. And so they're going to throw them into what river? The Nile River, yeah. And so that's where, Lord willing, we'll pick up next week in chapter 2 as we are introduced to Moses. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I know I went over tonight. I apologize. Okay, make sure that you give me your registration form. And like I said, those questions will not be due next week because we didn't get to chapter 2.
So don't worry about it, but we'll go ahead and work on chapter one.